We are going to continue our look at art around the world in chronological order for the most part. Uh, we looked at Paleolithic art in our very first week. And then in the last lecture, we took a very brief stroll through Egyptian art with a little bit of Mesopotamian art and a little bit of the Neolithic as kind of a way to begin to understand the Egyptians. So I want to look at some art from India and then also some art from China, specifically around religion and Buddhism and Hinduism. And then in the summer class, I have an optional lecture that is a short video on Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, and how, uh, how all three of them are used together to create social bindings, psychological health, and physical health. So rather than one religion, we have Confucianism in terms of how to relate to others in a society. We have Taoism in terms of how to be healthy with your body. And then Buddhism, which is health for the mind. So again, pay attention in your canvas, on your schedule, and the modules to see whether or not this is a optional assignment or is a mandatory assignment. So the lecture is titled uh, An Art for the Sacred Realm, India and China. So we are looking at art coming from the subcontinent of India and mostly we are looking at art in architecture, um, some wall paintings, and some sculpture. We are then also going to look at how Buddhism, which begins in India and ultimately moves westward, becomes the major force that it is as a religion in places like Japan and China and also in Southeast Asia as well. So in ancient India, again, a massive, massive continent, and a continent so large, a massive subcontinent, I should say, and so large that after World War II and the end of British rule, British influence in India, there is a great partition between the Islamic part of India and then the Hindu part of India. And the Islamic part is now Pakistan today. So in ancient India, we find human activity at least as far as 75,000 years ago, probably even longer if we start adding in other proto-humans and human species before modern Homo sapiens. In the Indus River Valley, which is here, in the Indus River Valley, we find civilizations from at least 3000 BC. And one of these is Mohenjo-Daro. It is a site around where Pakistan is today, built around 2600 BC. It was one of the larger settlements in the Indus Valley and one of the early urban settlements that would be similar to what we studied in Egypt and Mesopotamia and will be studying in the Greeks in the earliest form of the Greeks, the Minoans in the island of Crete. So what we can see from the ruins is that they have a grid of a planned layout of a grid, rectilinear buildings. We also have a uh, two different levels, one the citadel and then one the lower city. The, the citadel is uh, known to have supported public baths and a large residential structure designed to house about 5,000 citizens and two large assembly halls that were probably used for civic purposes. In terms of religions, we have Vedic traditions in India or the Indo-Aryan culture with texts of the Vedas uh, that were composed in their written language Sanskrit. 
The Vedic period lasts from about 1700 to 500 BC, and we find in here the foundations of Hinduism and also other aspects of culture on the Indian subcontinent. So the Vedic people had a, uh, a belief in the transmigration of the soul. So in the transmigration of the soul, they believe in a ultimate, ultimate spirituality, a, a creative God force called the Brahman. And from the Brahman, there is a little part of it called the Atman in every single human being, every single living thing. And the goal of each one of these living things is to do what's proper in relationship to Dharma. So based on your class or your caste, you have a specific way to act, and you are supposed to act in that regard. And then also, you are to do good as much as you can, and through your dharma, you get karma, which is if you do good things, good things will happen to you. And ideally, you can get out of the cycle of suffering that comes from living and dying and ultimately transmigrate into higher beings. And then at the end, your Atman is set free and your creative part of yourself, your soul or whatever you want to call it, will rejoin with the larger Brahman. So the Vedas, the texts, are considered impersonal and authorless. There is literature in the test of what is heard and what is remembered. In the Mahabharata, uh, we have the creation of the Vedas, which is credited to the god Brahma. The Upanishads are the meditation, philosophy, and spiritual knowledge that come in the Vedas and have been very influential on Western philosophy. So Hinduism is the dominant religion in India and also spread to other places in South Asia. They believe in dharma and uh, karma, uh, daily morality. There is a intellectual and philosophical points of view rather than a rigid common set of beliefs. It is one of the oldest religions. It is considered to be somewhat of an eternal way. They practice daily rituals like worshiping and recitation. They have annual festivals and pilgrimages. And then they also have a caste set of priests who are their intermediaries who take their offerings and make sure that the right God gets to them. They believe that all creatures have a soul and that the soul is uh, eternal. One of the most prominent avatars of the three gods that we'll look at of Vishnu include Krishna, and Krishna is a, a central kind of character in the Mahabharata, and also what I particularly love about the paintings that we find in Hinduism is I particularly love the stylization of the paintings. Of course, the glowing figures, the stylization rather than exact anatomies, the color, but also the enlarged eyes as well. They remind me a lot of art that we have looked at earlier in our class from artists like Mark Ryden. Um, and they have a very playful, but also metaphysical quality to them. Their sacred text is the Bhagavad Gita, 700 verse Hindu scripture, part of the epic of the Mahabharata. It is a framework of a dialogue between Pandava, a prince, uh, a Pandava prince named Arjuna, and his guide and charioteer Krishna. And here we're looking at Arjuna and Lord Krishna and him giving some advice in this painting. And we are seeing the same thing here. So in the Bhagavad Gita, we are looking at the Hindu synthesis that emerges in the classical period. Uh, it is the uh, kind of sealing achievement incorporating various religious traditions. There are three dominant trends in the religion, the Dharma-based householder life, the Enlightenment-based renunciation, and devotional-based theism, praying to gods, 
becoming enlightened by renouncing your deeds and per trying to perfect yourself and also doing the correct thing based on your caste. Is your caste a warrior? Is your caste a priest? Is your caste a laborer? And doing what is right within what you were born to be. Now, unlike other types of religious texts, this one takes place on a battlefield. And what the battlefield is somewhat setting up for us is, you know, at times we have to go to war. And at times when we go to war, we have to kill. So if I have to kill for war, how can I still be a good person? How can I still set my soul free? That is the conundrum of the Bhagavad Gavita. The three major gods in the poly polytheistic religion are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the Trimuti. And in this, Brahma is the creator and doesn't do much more than create. Vishnu is the preserver, and Shiva is the destroyer or the transformer. So the manifestations are all kind of different gods in relation to Brahman, or the absolute ruler. So there are different forms of religion and terms of gods that you can mainly worship to. You can either be a Shaivite, and uh, Shiva is most of who you're praying to, and uh, also you could have uh, be someone that is praying to other gods like uh, Vishnu, and there are different temples for them. Again, here in the paintings, we see that same playful style. The gods are seated on a lotus leaf, and we are also looking at the kind of very pleasant bluish skin and the pleasant looks on their face of benevolence. Now in art, we are here looking at a high relief sculpture. This panel is made in the sixth century BC. We are looking at the god Vishnu dreaming our world into existence. Wearing his cylindrical crown, he is sleeping on the coiled serpent of infinity. And then the female side of his energy, Lakshmi, is holding his foot and rubbing it. Moved by her, he dreams the god Brahma into existence. Brahma is in the center of these figures here, sitting in a meditative pose in a lotus blossom that is understood to grow from Vishnu's navel. Brahma, in turn, will create the world of space by thinking, may I become many. So Brahma is the creator of all people then. Here we see the god Devi, also known as Durga, killing the buffalo demon with her multiple arms and she's stepping on the, um, the buffalo demon. So she has 16 arms. Each arm is displaying a weapon, creating movement in the image. And she is uh, from, her name, Devi, is from the Sanskrit room, the divine, related to the masculine form of Deva. So the gods have female and masculine forms, very similar to the gods of Olympus. There are 12 gods in the Greek Olympus, six male, six female. She is conceptualized by the Shakta tradition of Hinduism. She is the female counterpart without whom the male aspect, which represents consciousness or discrimination, remains impotent and void. Goddess worship is an integral part of Hinduism, and each one of the gods has a male and female energy to it. So Durga is a supreme being, and she is one of the five primary forms of God. And here she is, again, in a story where she is defeating a demon. Hindu architecture, this is the Khandariya Mahadeva temple. It is one of the largest and most ornate Hindu temples in India. It was built around 1000 BC. And what we have 
are these curving towers that are called shikaras. And the shikaras are getting larger and larger like the Himalayan mountain uh, where uh, Shiva would live. Inside of the inner sanctum under the tallest shikara is the garbaria. And the garbaria is a marble linga representing Shiva and that would be where the priests would leave offerings that you would leave for the gods. Now the interesting thing is the relief carvings all the way around the temple have erotic art all over it. Lots of sexual tantric poses and the idea is is that the physical is left on the outside of the building and on the inside is the spiritual realm. For those of you interested in seeing Hinduism here in California, in Chino Hills in San Bernardino County, there is a massive sandstone, um, a massive sandstone uh, Hindu temple that is built, complete with the shikaras, complete with the womb room inside of it. On the outside, it is red. On the inside, it has uh, whitish qualities and all completely carved and ornate. There are uh, these really interesting dolls standing at various altars, and they do welcome you as outsiders to visit as long as you come respectfully. Women should cover their shoulders and their legs. So Buddhism also is a former religion that comes from India. A Nepalese prince named Siddhartha Gautama, he was unsatisfied with the religions and the types of Vedic and Hindu religions and the caste systems. And so he began to meditate, trying to figure out another way. And he ultimately, through meditation, he realizes that his ego and his attachment to materialism and the physical world is what causes suffering. And if we can relieve ourselves of our ego, if we can do good, we can find a kind of purity inside of us, an awakening inside of us. So Buddha will go on to preach in Sarnath in the Deer Park. We will look at a lot of Buddhist art here. So as I had mentioned earlier when we were studying iconography, we can always tell Buddha because Buddha has no emotion in the face. Buddha has the elongated earlobes of a wealthy prince along with the silk robes. Buddha is always sitting cross-legged and meditating, generally on a lotus, and has a golden halo of fire around him. And his hands are in signals called mudras, teaching signals. So the Dharmapada is a collection of sayings of the Buddha in verse form and one of the best known Buddhist scriptures. And some of these which I have shown for you here uh, make the kind of Buddhist way of life available to anyone. So in chapter 14, the Buddha the Awakened in verse 183, not to commit any sin, to do good and governance of one mind. That is the teaching of all of the awakened. In the way, in chapter 20, in verse 278, all things are grief, all created things are grief and pain. He who knows and sees this becomes passive in pain. This is the way that leads to purity. In verse 279, all forms are unreal. He who knows and sees this becomes passive in pain. This is a way that leads to purity. In other words, much like we see with Plato in the Greek chapter, Plato believes that the mind is pure, the forms of the mind, things like goodness or the sphere, these are pure things that in the real world are not as perfect as they are in the mind. And you see the same things here, that all forms are unreal, very, very similar. The stupas, these are structures that were commissioned when uh, uh, India had become 
uh, uh, had accepted Buddhism. Uh, this is Ashoka the Great in the third century BC. And what we see with stupas are these burial mounds that are covered in earth and then covered in masonry. And then the Buddha's ashes when he was cremated are in a number of these stupas. And these great stupas then are uh, places where the original uh, Buddha's um, remains can be found and the spirituality that maybe can be attained by visiting them. In India, we have a number of caves that were built to the numerous religions in India that were Hindu, that were a religion called the Jain, Jainism, and also Buddhism as well. These were uh, all carved around the second century BC to around 650 AD, and they were somewhat covered and kind of rediscovered in the 1800s, and now they are uh, um, all kind of uncleared, uh, cleared out, and they are tourist attractions. So out of single stones, we see the barrel vaults that we had looked at in our architecture sections, seated Buddhas, and we also find some of the finest Buddhist frescoes of the ancient world. So here we're looking at bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are followers of Buddha who rather than when they become enlightened, freeing themselves from this world, they stay here in the world to enlighten others. And here we see Padmapen, and it is a form of Avalokiteshvara, the lotus giver. The bodhisattva is holding a lotus and a begging bowl, hair piled on top of the head, and this is one of the frescoes that are in these Ajanta caves. The Ellora Caves nearby also is a, a carved site. There are 34 caves, again, that are Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain. And again, we find the similar features of the barrel faults carved out of rock, seated Buddhas. And this particular area here, all carved out of a single rock that has walkways, relief sculpture, there's an elephant, and obelisks, um, really, really fine, fine artwork. And that same kind of carving art in caves happens in China as Hinduism or as Buddhism is moving through the Silk Road through trade between India and China, we have here the Magao Caves. The Magao Caves are carved in the beginning of the first and second century in our common era, and merchants are traveling back and forth, bringing the religion. At the left here, the Yonggang Grottoes, we see a, a Chinese Buddhist, um, we see a number of these caves, 252 of them, with 51,000 Buddhist statue and statuettes, some of them being very, very large. Uh, these are the Yung Gang Grottoes. These are Magao Caves here. So the Magao Caves, this is uh, uh, several caves, again, with large Buddhist statues, with frescoes, and a number of caves that are painted and also serving as aids for meditation along typically trade routes. These Magao Caves are maintained by the Getty in Los Angeles, and in fact, the Getty created reproductions, in particular of this cave, which they brought to the Getty in Los Angeles, and I was fortunate enough to be able to go see it and get a sense of what this cave might be like were I to travel to China. Now, in the Magao Caves, what we get is a cave known as the Library Cave. So in this Library Cave, there are thousands of scrolls that had been left there for hundreds of years. And then it was walled off sometime about a thousand years ago. In the late 1800s, there was a British explorer 
that went and found the keeper of the cave and the cave offered the keeper some money in exchange for a handful of the scrolls. And one of the scrolls that he received was the Diamond Sutra here. The Diamond Sutra is a small scroll and is the very first printed dated material. So this is dated May 11th, 868, and is the oldest dated printed. And remember, the printing press will not reach Europe, not become a European invention until 1455, 600 years later. In various forms of Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism is one of the most widely practiced traditions in China and East Asia. They focused on the Amitabha Buddha. And in Pure Land traditions, it's believed that you uh, uh, enter a Western paradise when you become enlightened. And we see a lot of paintings representing this purity. Here, we're seeing the descent of the Amida and 25 Bodhisattvas. This is a hanging scroll that is in ink and with gold uh, on, and painted on silk. And the images have a flattened quality to them. And what we often find in Chinese Buddhist paintings is that they have a vertical format rather than a horizontal format. We'll see that as we look at a at a landscape painting next. Another form of Buddhism is Zen Buddhism, Zen meaning meditation. It teaches enlightenment is achieved through realization that you are already enlightened. And this awakening can happen gradually or in a flash or in a moment. And a type of Zen painting, and Zen is also taught one-on-one -on -one rather than in groups. Here we're looking at a Japanese painting by Seshu Toyo. He is one of the great masters of Zen painting, a kind of splash painting. And it has that kind of awakening in a minute where when you first look at it, it maybe is nothing. But all of a sudden you realize that this is a Buddhist landscape. And the Buddhist landscape will typically have mountains surrounded by mist. And then typically you'll have flowing water. And here we have an old gnarled tree implying spirits of ancestors, and then typically also a Buddhist temple, all vertically done. Very typical of the painting style. But this style is uniquely Japanese in Zen Buddhism in terms of it being abstract and very, um, very modest in terms of the amount of technique that it's giving us. It's a great example of how to use ink. Here in Southern California, we have a number of Buddhist temples with the large community of Japanese and Chinese people and also uh, the Vietnamese who are Buddhist as well, many of them. And the largest of the Buddhist temples is in Hacienda Heights. Uh, I totally recommend taking a trip here. It is on a mountaintop. It is massive. It has uh, great sculptures. I'm showing you the Arhat Garden at the bottom, who were Buddha's original follower, followers. They all have magical powers. It's a really great place to go and spend an afternoon. There's also some massive prayer rooms that uh, have some huge, huge statues of Buddhas in them. Again, I highly, highly recommend it. So in China, not only is Buddhism practiced as a kind of cleansing of the mind, but you also practice kind of social relationships through Confucianism, which is an ethical and philosophical system, occasionally described as a religion, that are developed from the teachings of the Chinese philosopher and also bureaucrat Confucius, who lived around the time of uh, 551 to 479 BC, around the same time that the Greeks are about to enter their classic age as well. He's a humanist who is focusing on practical order with the emphasis of the importance of family rather than a transcendent divine. So in China, you venerate your ancestors. You may have gone to Chinese restaurants and notice that they have shrines of fruit uh, and incense set up those are for your ancestor spirits. 
your ancestors are the mediators to the gods and by remembering them and showing honor to them they talk to the gods and bring you good luck so confucianism is the belief that human beings are teachable, improvable, and perfectible through personable and communal endeavors, especially self-cultivation and self-creation. So learning. Confucius also is credited with setting up the exams to become government workers. In China, they had a meritocracy where even if you were born poor, if you were smart, if you understood philosophic teachings, if you could write poetry. They had exams every year, and if you did well on the exams, you could become a government worker and become part of the upper class. So this idea of self-cultivation is part of that. So in other words, from your honoring the family, you honor the local community, and honor China as well. He believes in social harmony. In other words, his wisdom is you shouldn't steal. It's bad for business. It's bad for the community. You shouldn't act with unethical behavior because it's bad for the community. It's bad for the state. It's bad for business. So in other words, what we begin to learn is, is that really good behavior helps us all prosper. In Taoism, so Taoism is the way or the path it is a belief that there is a way chosen for you, and when you find that path, you will flow effortlessly down the river of life. If that path is presented to you and you resist it, then you will be working against the river upstream and life will be hard. In Taoism, we have a number of supernatural entities, we have a number of spiritual teachers, and we find in Taoism things like this incense burner that is showing us a paradise of the Isle of the Immortals, and the Immortals you can see in some of the decorations here. So when you think of Chinese painting and Chinese art, in the Song Dynasty period is really maybe where we see the perfection of the style of Buddhist painting. So here we have a hanging scroll painted by Guaoxi, completed in 1072. We have the vertical landscape, we have the mountains, we have the mist, and the mist notice is the empty space. So when we learned about positive and negative space, we can see that really perfected in Buddhist, Chinese, and Japanese landscape painting. We saw that with the Zen painting here, and again, we see it here. So notice that the styles change a bit, but the basic subject matter, the mountains, the vertical location, rather than the horizontal landscape that we see in Western painting, the mists that surround the mountain, running water, and then typically a Buddhist temple somewhere in the mountain. This is done consistently in these works of art, but there are very unique ways that the inks are handled and the colors that might be used and how either careful it's painted or how in a way almost seemingly haphazard or splashed that it's painted. There's a number of different ways of going about this. And these elements in these landscape paintings are again something that I give you in this last slide. We're also getting a kind of mobile mid-air perspective where we're not standing on the ground, but we're kind of hanging in space as we're looking at these images. So I also have a supplemental lecture in here. In the supplemental lecture, I go a little bit deeper into China. We see the development of China from the first emperor. Here we're looking at the Great Wall of China that was started by the first emperor. I talk about how Chinese letters, the calligraphy kind of begins as a divination on bones. The early dynasty of the Shang dynasty, the Book of Changes or the I Ching, which is used for divination. I talk about the Mandate of Heaven from the Zhou Dynasty. The Mandate of Heaven says that basically every dynasty 
of emperors will change between 200 and 350 years. In other words, you have a great kind of movement that will begin and it will throw out a corrupt government, replacing it with a new government. And then when those great leaders die off, you begin to get into nepotism where the son is not as great as the father, the grandson is even lazier, and eventually their ideas will fall out of favor and a new government will begin. Talk about Confucianism, show you some scrolls, talk about Taoism again, and we look at the bronzes that Chinese make. We talk about the Qin Dynasty. We have seen the Terracotta Warriors already with Qin Shi Hong, the first emperor. After the fall of the Qin Dynasty, we have the Han Dynasty. And in the Han Dynasty, we have kind of the classical uh, China era uh, with great bronze sculptures, pagodas. We have various forms of Buddhism. And then I go into other dynasties. Here we're looking at a, uh, from a Guanyin, who's a bodhisattva, and is a bodhisattva for travelers. He is both male and female in terms of the look, usually seated with one leg up like this to give you a sense of royal ease, and is also... Uh, there to give good luck and to help travelers. So I give you a number of kind of different elements in Chinese history. I also go into the arts of Japan a little bit. We're looking at one of their earliest, earliest ceramic types, uh, the roped pattern Jaman. Here we're looking at Mount Fuji, which we have seen in various artworks. We look at uh, various ideas like the Hanawa style from the Azuka. Shinto is their earliest religion. It is a religion based on nature, that spirits reside in waterfalls and old trees. It is a warrior religion. They have that along with Buddhism. From the Heian period is where Buddhism becomes accepted. We have looked at the Biodine Temple in our architecture lecture. We have also looked at the giant bronze sculpture inside of the Temple of Buddha in our iconography lecture. I show you some of the scenes painted on room dividers rather than on the walls. Again, you see the sense of the trees and the spirituality and mountains and trees. Here we see the pine wood, but we also see the mists that we saw in the Buddhist landscapes as well. And then it's in 1600 to 1868 that we have the development of the woodcut print in the Edo period, and that's where we get this great artwork that really transfix the minds of Westerners to Japanese culture, like the Great Wave by Hakusai. We saw also 36 views of Mount Fuji when we were discussing art on art. So this style of art is woodblock printing. There is no chiaroscuro. There is no exact perspective as we would think in Western art. Instead, it is an art of line and color and showing the world, the floating world of kabuki theater and courtesans. And then I spend a little bit of time showing you some contemporary Chinese artists. I think Ai Weiwei is one of the greatest artists working today, working in sculptures like the Forever Bicycle, where he has made the bicycles go on for as long as he wants to make them. He has also remade ancient artifacts, showing here him dropping a Han Dynasty urn in an uh, attack on the Chinese Communist government, and they're trying to erase Chinese history. They don't want any history to exist besides the Communist history. This is Guy Ko Chang. He works in fireworks and has made some spectacular artwork. We saw his footprints in the sky for the Beijing Olympics in our Elements and Principles lecture. 
This is one of my kind of favorite artists, Mu Boyan. I love these large sumo wrestlers, delicately balanced with the ancient healing concept of cupping. In cupping, you get suction into various uh, areas of the body that cause you pain, and by drawing the blood to the surface, it causes any swelling to go away. And as someone who has this done to me, I can tell you that yes, it does work. It's painful, but it does work. In Japan, we have looked at the artist Takashi Murakami. We have seen his flowers. We have talked about Mr. D.O.B. And he has created a super flat style and a manifesto where he's flattening the representational picture plane and then also flattening the difference between Eastern and Western culture. And I think one of his greatest works of art are these large paintings that he makes through various means of painting and printing. And we are looking at our hats. We are looking at uh, Buddhist characters who all have unique individual personalities. And uh, they are spectacular. This one of the paintings is a couple hundred feet long, and it is at the Broad Museum in Los Angeles. Something I highly recommend for you to take a look at. So for the assignment, if it will, oh, here it is here, sorry. Set up one last time. All right, so that is, a, again, a kind of, now realize that these lectures are no way comprehensive. It's just a way for you to get a taste of different art around the world. Maybe you see some similarities in the ways that they're using maybe bronze or they're making ceramics or they're painting, but we also see, I think, very unique traditions and very unique handlings of how imagery and iconography works as well. So I'd like you to watch this eight minute video. The video quality is not great, but the information in it is fantastic. And so what it will do is it will tell you what Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism are. I would like you to clearly explain these from the video. And then I would like you to think about what creates a good life. So when we look at the Greeks in the coming lectures, we see that the good life or eudomania, eudomania is identical to a just life. And that basically a just life refers to a person that is expressing virtue and good character in relationship to each other. So I want you to elaborate on what you think a good life is. So is a good life how you treat other people, how you find a sense of calm within yourself, and also do you think Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism can help to achieve this good life? and then comment on another student's thread for a point. Look forward to seeing what you have to say. Talk to you soon.